Hi there, my name is Pete McCormick and I'm a filmmaker and a writer and a songwriter. And today I want to talk about Jaws and how it is a masterclass in not only filmmaking and writing, but also in resilience and adapting to failure. Ten days before shooting started, the film lacked a solid cast, a finished script, and a mechanical shark that worked. And the shark is the movie. Not a day went by throughout the entire shoot that the shark didn't somehow malfunction. On top of that, Spielberg demanded that the film be shot on the ocean. He wanted to preserve that visceral anger and danger of the ocean that could not be found on a lake and could not be found in a studio. Of course this ended up being the right choice, but it was a difficult choice because nobody had ever shot on the ocean before and there's a good reason for that. Let me put it this way. Take uh, the director of photography, Bill Butler. He sets up a shot on the ocean. He has the shark in the right place. He has the boat in the right place. He has the background in the right place. He says to Steven Spielberg, listen man, I just, I got a bit of a stiff back. Give me two minutes to stretch and I'll come back. He stretches his back, he comes back, he looks in the camera and he says, who moved the shark? Wh who moved the boat? Who, who, who moved the background? Nobody moved the background. It's like you're being gaslit when you're filming on the ocean because everything is moving in different directions and the shot will just not stay stable. It's hard enough shooting outdoors because of the ever-changing light, but to shoot on the ocean is to go against all the stable constraints that make filming easier, which is why everybody shoots in the studio or wants to shoot in the studio or generally shoots in the studio because it's so stable. In fact, that and the shark helped extend the shooting schedule from 55 days to I think 159 days, nearly a three-fold increase, and the budget went from 3.5 million, I think, to 10 million. It takes a lot of resiliency to keep going when you're making a film about a shark and the mechanical shark that you're using for the film doesn't really work. And Steven Spielberg honestly wondered if he would ever work again. So in honor of that struggle, of the struggle of the entire cast and crew, I'm going to talk about Jaws and why it is a masterclass in filmmaking, in film writing. It has the most compelling moment. It has the greatest hook. It's got the great exciting incident. It's got the great halfway point. It's just a great, great example of film structure. And finally, I want to talk about why it is a masterclass in resilience. Let's start with the opening scene of the entire movie. And the opening scene is amazing for multiple reasons. First of all, it's one of the most terrifying scenes in the history of cinema. Cinema. There's a beach party going on with a bunch of teenagers sitting around a campfire, a guitar playing. It's the 70s and it's, they're having a great time. A boy and a girl look at each other and somehow they instinctively know to get up and run towards the beach to go for a midnight swim. The boy is very drunk and falls back on the beach and can't get his clothes off and lies there and falls asleep. The girl, Chrissy, goes out into the ocean and her fate is sealed. Of course, uh, we know Early on it's sealed because we hear that incredible music from John Williams, the famous score, the E to the F, doo -doo, doo -doo, that terrifies us to this day. But what's amazing about that scene is we don't see the shark at all. We don't see it because the shark doesn't work. This turned out to be a huge blessing. Spielberg decided uh, using Hitchcock as his inspiration not to show the shark, in fact to have that as an intent and it worked brilliantly. I'm sure it changed the way Bill Butler filmed the underwater scenes where we see the shark's point of view as it goes through the water uh, behind John Williams' incredible score. But I do want to add this. What this scene is, is a hook. And whether you're writing a novel or writing a screenplay, the hook is vital. And this hook is one of the all-time great hooks. Now, in the theater, people screamed. Does your hook make anybody scream? That's a good checklist. Yes, it does make everybody scream. Now, it does doesn't have to. Different hooks have different meanings, but they must bring us in. We need to compel the reader or the viewer to continue watching. Margaret Atwood says, the biggest sin of any author is to not be interesting. You must keep the viewer's interest. So that scene with one of the great hooks in cinematic history propels us into the next morning in Amity, this small, quaint town 
on the East Coast of the United States, and we meet Chief Brody, played by Roy Scheider, and we see his little life, and he's getting ready for work, and his wife is helping get ready, and his kids are around, and it's a quaint little scene. He gets a phone call saying there's been a missing person. As he's leaving, his wife says to him, be careful out there, and he says, what, in this town? And off he leaves. It's a great foreshadowing of what lies ahead, and he heads down to the beach to pursue this missing persons report. He's looking along the beach with the kid who was on the beach with the girl that night and suddenly he hears a whistle from way down the beach and he runs down the beach and his deputy is there on his hands and knees trying to not throw up or is throwing up and there they see the dismembered hand of Chrissy stuck in the sand covered in crabs and we know at that moment that everything in Chief Brody's life is about to change and that is called the inciting incident. Now he is directly involved and that's why it's an inciting incident. It is pushing the main character's life forward in a completely unexpected direction. So we've gone from this opening scene with this incredible hook to the next scene which delivers this inciting incident which propels the screenplay and the movie forward with incredible power. And here I want to remind writers about the key elements of a scene. All scenes need to shift. In the opening scene, the hook, we have the party and then it shifts to the shark attack, a huge shift that propels us forward. In the inciting incident, it starts in Chief Brody's lovely little quaint house, and then he goes down to the beach, and bam, he finds the remains of this poor girl who was attacked by the shark. A huge shift. Keep looking at your scenes. Are they shifting? There's no exception to this rule as far as I know. Scenes shift. And the scenes in Jaws shift magnificently, and we are fully involved. But none of this would have been possible if not for Spielberg's resilience and ability to cope with all kinds of problems coming at him. He has his own inciting incidents, i.e. the shark doesn't work, he has to respond in a certain way, and he keeps making good decisions under pressure, and the best one is to realize we must create fear by not seeing the shark, and that ends up creating a legendary film and it shows great resilience. And I love this fact because it reminds me to remember that when things are going down in a negative way, the resolution to that problem might be even better than what you would hope for. So do not give up. This even happened to me on a small scale. When I was making a series for HBO called Sports on Fire, it was a documentary series, a six-part series where I was making moments in history that clashed with sports into small documentaries. For example, uh, the Nazi Olympics of 1936, where the politics of Hitler met the Olympic Games and Jesse Owens, and that's a great story. But I was doing another episode on steroids, and of course I couldn't get footage of the players, the Major League Baseball players and the NFL players, because I was talking about steroids. And the major leagues were not too open to me getting uh, the footage, so I had to make a choice. How do I tell this story without having any footage of those players? Well, what I chose to do was use pictures of them in more civilian moments. That is to say, when they were in court or when they were discussing steroids before Congress. And I stuck with that very closely. And what I did was I made it look like that was my choice all along. And I would say that looked worse for the major leagues themselves, but worked great for the film. And uh, one of the keys there was to actually find an alternate plan and stick to it, not to mix and match in any kind of awkward way. So Spielberg did the same thing. I, it sounds funny comparing them. I'm not comparing them, of course. But my point is the major problem going on in that film's production, The Shark, led to a film being so much greater. And I would argue that not seeing the shark for so long also led to that wonderful midpoint moment where Chief Brody brings his son up on the shore and drops him on the beach and he's unconscious due to shock and, and, and Brody looks up at the ocean and he realizes it's all personal now and he has to go out and face the shark and he looks out at the horizon line of the sea and uh, we're just going, oh boy, here comes the next part of the adventure. 
and it's one of the great midpoints of any film I think because we don't know what's under that water we we know of it we know what it can do but we haven't really seen it yet and Spielberg's brought us along magnificently all the way again because of the problem when we finally do see the shark for the first time and head pops out of the water spoiler at around the 77 minute mark when Chief Brody played by Roy Scheider is dumping the chum into the ocean uh, we do see it earlier in the lagoon, but barely, it's underwater. But anyway, he looks back and the shark just comes out of the water. It scares the crap out of Chief Brody. He films in that great Spielbergian way. Roy Scheider backs up slowly with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. We see him stagger back to the uh, cabin of the boat where Quint Robert Shaw is sitting there and he says, you're gonna need a bigger boat, a classic line ad-libbed. But uh, when that shark comes out, even if it isn't 100% realistic, we are so invested now after 77 minutes of not seeing the shark, but seeing the horror that a sock puppet could have leapt out of the water. And we would have said, that's enough, I'm terrified. And so much of that comes about because of the resilience of Spielberg and the greatness of Spielberg and the creativity of Spielberg and the crew and the cast who kept pushing forward. Remember that in your projects. This film is full of examples of how uh, resilience and creative thinking and luck uh, made such a huge difference in this film and it can be the same thing in your life so that's it those are the examples I have to remind you to stay resilient to remain strong to remain creative to remain hopeful when obstacles are coming our way and brutally affecting our creative journeys our writing journeys our free-flowing thoughts or even our lives just to remember to stay positive. You never know what great thing might come out of a great problem. You may just end up with something much greater and that's exciting. So that's the tip of the day. Do not be defeated by the problems you are facing. Uh, believe in yourself and believe in your process. And we'll talk soon. Thanks for dropping by. Subscribe already. And while you're at it, Send cash.